So far we talked about the Fourier transform, which is mostly used for the signal analysis, but also for the system case, doesn't matter. We saw that we, have, we can talk about the system itself, when, it's, when you have the convolution, you have the uh, changing to the multiplication stuff, or filtering, filtering is just in the, uh, the Fourier domain for the system. But specifically for the systems, we have a kind of uh, transform or another domain which is quite similar to the Fourier domain. And that's why uh, we have to study it. It's more representative in the Fourier domain than the Fourier domain for the system. And I think it's a bit simpler for the system to use the Z domain. <coughs> This is Z domain. Z is actually coming uh, from the first name of Professor Zadeh, an Iranian scientist in Berkeley, that actually first brought up the idea of this. But it's uh, quite similar to the Fourier domain with a slight difference. And the difference is that for those basis functions that we use in the Fourier domain, it was the exponential form e to the power of j omega n, we just add a scale of r, r e to the power of j omega n. But the point is that it's clear that when you use scaling, then you should care about the problem of convergence. So it means that z domain It's actually necessary for the Z domain to, to have another extra com condition. And that's the condition of convergence. So you have the Z transform together with the region of convergence. So it doesn't make sense to say that that's the Z transform of a system without talking about the region of convergence. When you talk about the z-domain, you have to, to make both clear that this is the z-transform based on this region of convergence. Okay? So replacing the previous eigenfunction of e to the power of j omega n with r e to the power of j omega n and replacing the same series, the formulation that we had already in the Fourier domain and replacing e to the power of something with this notation Z, then we will get the same idea. We will get such a thing in the output, which is again, you are in the time domain. You have the eigenfunction in the time domain, and you get a coefficient in the Z domain, together with its region of convergence. So that's why Z definition with like this is also an eigenfunction but for the system definition of the Z transform quite similar to the Fourier transform comes like this as a series just replace the e to the power of geometry with this and you can see that Z transform and Fourier transform they are very close to each other. So we can say that Fourier transform is the Z transform on the unit circle. If R equals to one, that's exactly the Fourier transform. So if you are taking the, the, the Z transform on a unit circle, you're actually doing the Fourier transform. That was the answer to this question. What's the use of then, uh, this generalization of using an R? Like, That's exactly what you said. It's a generalization of the Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. And for the case of the systems, it makes sense. I, I get it, but why the generalization? Because there are many systems that they are not definable in the, Z, in the Fourier domain, but you can define a kind of representation in the Z domain because Z domain is more generalized form than the Fourier domain. So 
you can define there are many many eigenfunctions those eigenfunctions are not existing in the Fourier domain but they are existing in the Z domain and that's why you can define almost every system in the Z domain but not necessarily in the Fourier domain and it's very important to have the system definition and analysis of the system in a in a good domain rather than the time domain in because example, I mean like in this domain except I can use the Fourier domain itself but then I don't see an example for Z transforms maybe in the uh, I don't have a clear example right now but if you just google it you can find thousands of examples that you cannot find something in the Fourier domain but you can have something in the Z domain mm -hmm. and you have actually the system which is stable in the Z domain def by the definition of the Z domain but you cannot find anything in the Fourier domain so you cannot have a representation in the Fourier domain a unique representation in the Fourier domain but you can find something in the Z domain mm -hmm. yes please um, if uh, we are uh, talking about uh, the real city now mm -hmm. the Z transform uh, is not of, with the N uh, from uh, 0 to infinity uh, uh, why, why is it from uh, uh, minus infinity, infinity to infinity and not uh, from uh, 0 to infinity we can have, it's, it's a, uh, you know, when you have the definition, the definition should work for every case. But as you said, for many real signals, it's not, you know, the time never goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we, that's just the definition. And using this definition, you're actually insisting on something. And that's the insisting on the stability of the system. When something is stable, a kind of series, when it's stable, even when it goes to the infinity, it means that it should be stable for n equal to something. So when, you, when we use this kind of definition, it's just a definition, but when you, have, you, when you are dealing with a noun signal, a real signal, you use, for example, if you know as an example that we showed already for the case of the window, you know that this is, the window is active only from minus n to n. So you just put minus n to n. That's all. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to minus infinity. You know that from minus infinity to some point, it's zero. There's no signal. But even though that someone says that, but infinity is, you know, a kind of, is a concept that can, no one can define it. So some people say that the signal which comes from a week ago is considered as minus infinity. Then if, if you have such kind of signal, it means that for, for the case of computer, maybe it's better to put it as a, to consider it as a minus infinity. But infinity is something unknown, it's ambiguous. The concept is ambiguous. So you don't know, uh, you know how exactly to define that. But at least in the case of the mathematical form, you see that that mathematical form applies here. There's no problem. The same thing goes for the d omega, d something. Can you define d? I say D is, for example, one microsecond. Then 10 years later, some, someone comes and says that one nanosecond is the D. The other one comes and says one picosecond is the D. Depending on how your appliance can work and the difference of one sample to another, D changes. But what happens as a result of these different, different D values, the different delta values? The result is approximation. If you have two consecutive samples which are closer to each other as a difference, as a delta, it means that you are getting more and more and more close to the real or the continuous signal. But on the other hand, your computation may explode. So that's quite a definition. These are some ambiguous parts of the, uh, the mathematics. When you write down everything in mathematical form, it's clear. But when you want to apply it in the practical form, you don't have a, you know, a nice definition for that, but at least you can have some sense of what happens if you, if you look uh, to the difference or the integral or the variation of the integral in the, in the practical form. So the Z transform is quite similar to the Fourier transform. The only difference, you need to have a region of convergence, which is already abbreviated by ROC the region of convergence. As an example, 
If you have the exponential form, the same function we studied over in the Fourier analysis, so you have a the power of n u n step function, then we want to try for the z transform. If we have such kind of system, what's the z transform for that? Just use the definition of the z transform. And you see that, again, you have to use the convergence property of the series. Mm -hmm. That series converges if, if absolute value of x is less than 1. That's the only condition it converges. Otherwise, it diverges. So it means that that series of the z transform converges if this is actually less than 1. And what does it mean? Because we know that z is nothing but e to the power of j to, uh, e to the power of j omega something, and the absolute value for e to the power of anything is just one. So it just depends on a, just depending on a, and when this means that this should be less than zero, it means that you are inside this circle, and it's circle definitely because e to the power of j omega. It's periodic. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. I think it's quite easy to understand it. So the region of convergence for that signal or system is a unit circle, everything inside. Provided that the radius of this circle is less than a. And if that a, you, you for example, is 1, it should be less than 1. If that's 2, it should be less than 2, and so on. In all these points inside this unit circle with the radius a, they can give you that x of z. So this x of z. And you can generalize that for many different other filters. Any questions so far? So let's move into the new concept of DFT. Discrete Fourier transform. So these abbreviations start to mess up DTFT, DFT, Z transform, and so on. And we will mess it up more in the future with DFS and so on. So discrete Fourier transform. We already saw the disadvantage, or it's better to say, a shortcoming of DTFT. DTFT is a periodic Fourier analysis or representation of the signal in the time domain but it's continuous because it's continuous you're not able to take the Fourier DTFT of a signal and starting to process it or to analyze it in the computer it's a continuous variable you cannot deal with the continuous entity so people said that okay just the same as the analog signal that we couldn't deal with in the processing and we started to take samples out of that so how come if we take samples out of the DTFT and then using those samples as something and as a representatives of the DTFT and dealing with those samples in the computer that was the idea motivating this idea People said that in DSP theory, okay, we, we can take the samples, but again, as we took samples from the analog signal in the time domain, and we had samples in the frequency domain, the TFT, but there were a lot of conditions out of that, which actually brought up the idea, brought up the idea of sampling theorem. The same sampling theorem should be also considered here, because we're taking samples, doesn't matter whether the signal is in frequency or the time domain, you're taking samples. In the same way that you had some conditions that you had for the time to frequency sampling, again, you should have some conditions for the sampling from the frequency components. And what comes up actually as the idea of sampling of DTFT. In general, sampling of the DTFT resolves DFT. When we talk about DFT or the frequency components or the frequency concept in the computer, we are talking about DFT, 
we're not talking about DTFT and the DFT algorithm is actually implemented using the FFT algorithm so if you have heard already about the FFT algorithm FFT is a fast implementation of DFT okay in MATLAB you just use FFT and is it means you are taking the DFT of the signal based on the theory that we had already in the sampling so in analog sampling I mentioned here so we need to take good samples not all the samples we need to take good samples if you oversample then you're faced with the same problem you're getting so many samples most of them are redundant or useless and you don't care about those samples so it's better to take nice samples but how those nice samples will be generated the study over the DFT gives us the idea so in analog sampling we saw that if signal is limited in the frequency spectrum if the signal is limited in the frequency spectrum which normally happens you don't have something unlimited in the spectrum if you have a signal limited in the frequency spectrum which is band limited it's called band limited signal then you can represent it in the frequency domain the TFT without losing any information you don't lose any information why because you can have the inverse transform to the time domain without losing any information you will get back again to the signal so the lossless representation of the signal by samples would be possible by this condition that would be possible the same idea comes up so if the signal is the duality idea signal is limited in the time domain then that would be possible to have a lossless in the frequency the DFT domain actually we're talking it would be possible to have a lossless representation of the signal in the frequency domain by its sample that's the idea how they use the DFT is actually mainly it's generated from the DFS discrete Fourier series DFS is not that much you know useful except for the case that we want to explain DFT so that's why I ignore talking about DFS but just to know that DFS is discrete Fourier series that's all and what this actually mean is completely in this slide so that figure should be representative for the things I want to explain if you have a signal X of M and you make it continuous with a period whatever period you want N for example so you have a signal X of M active from 0 to N minus 1 you can use N as whatever you like and you make it periodic then you use the tilde sign on top of the signal that means that signal is periodic and if you, now if you make it periodic with the period for example n the signal will look like this every periodic signal will be represented using the Fourier series we know already periodic signals can be less last less represented using the Fourier series from signal systems and that's the Fourier series for such kind of periodic signal and we know that the Fourier series is also periodic so so you take again the major period the main period something that's from 0 to n minus 1 from the Fourier the DFS domain as to be the DFT of the signal which is actually in the window 0 to n minus 1 so DFT is nothing but the DFS of the periodic form of the signal in the window of endpoints that you have made the signal periodic with did you get the meaning? it's a bit complicated but it's 
actually also very easy. So, how is the process, the algorithm? You have this X of n. You want to get the DFT values. What do you do? You make it periodic, first of all. When you say DFT, you always have another parameter coming with. We say, how many points DFT? We say n point DFT. So that's not like the Fourier analysis that to say that, okay, uh, we have a signal, what is the Fourier domain? No. In DFT, we say that we, s we have the signal. Tell me about the end point DFT of the signal. And this end should vary from point to point. And what is actually meaning the N, the concept of N means you have first, you have to make the original signal, the main signal periodic with that N, looking like this, doing the discrete Fourier series, and take just this N values as the DFT coefficients. Did you get it? Simply. And That's DFT. And we do, we do this for all the ends. So, so where we have chosen only like a single thing, right? So it's, it's just virtually done. You don't need to do anything. It's virtually done. But when you want to calculate the coefficients of the DFS, you need the signal to be considered as periodic with a period of n. That's all. But when you're calculating the coefficients of the DFS for the original, the main window, you have just a few number of the active coefficients, and the less, you know, the rest of the, you know, from the other side is just the periodic form of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you just keep the first period and ignore the others, and it means that it's the DFT of the signal. That's all. Mm -hmm. Practically, it, is, it actually loads you no, no extra effort. Yes. When you repeat it, you mirror the signal or you do some other thing? I mean, like in this case, have you mirrored the signal? Do you hear you mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not mirroring, it's periodic form of the signal. When you say mirroring, it's symmetric form of that, even if, you know, even if this, this figure actually looks like mirroring, mm -hmm. but it can be anti-symmetric in the middle, then it doesn't mean exactly mirroring. It's a it's replicating. replicated form, it's not mirroring. There is a very, uh, you know, slight difference or delicate difference between the mirroring and replication. I mean, like, you can do it in two ways, right? Like, just repeat the pattern like this, or like uh, the other way is mirroring. You can just, like, for the right side, just mirror it like this, and then for the left side. These are two, two hands I have. Yeah. Are these hands replicated or they're mirrored? Mirror. Mirror. They are mirrored. Yeah. But if I do like this, then they are replicated. Yeah. So in this case, it's... In this case, both meanings overlap. <laughs> but in general, no. Just write down on the page, piece of paper, you'll see that replication is different from mirroring. So that was the idea of DFS and DFT. And, yeah. So the idea was that when you, take the, the, when you have the DFS, it's, you know, a periodic form, you just take the first period, one period of that. And that's the coefficients that you need actually to work with in the computer. That's all. When you take the D, when you when you use the FFT command in the MATLAB or in C, you're actually getting these values. With an algorithm, that algorithm is called FFT. The process is called DFT. Yes, please. I would like to make sure that I understood the, the concept. So basically, we have a limited uh, uh, That's signal, signal. Si signal in time domain. So mm -hmm. we make it periodic by replication. And afterward, we make we take the discrete Fourier uh, series. series, and afterward, we take the first uh, period at uh, discrete Fourier. Uh, time yes, right? but the point is that n here by this representation, you see that n, for example, just comes after the signal ends. Right. But you can make it this n, the periodicity, to be even inside the signal or outside the signal with some zero padding. Okay. Well, that n really differs. Mm -hmm. Did you get it? n can make a large difference in the DFT that you will take in the end. Yes? So, um, and is it, do you uh, take a signal which is not periodic? You make it periodic to... 
uh, use of EFT is so uh, there are. Look at here. Yes. If signal is limited in time, you can have a lossless representation as a DFT values, such that using those DFT values, you can go back to the time in the time signal. If the signal is not limited in time, then you will not get lossless representation. So basically, to go back, you have to do again the, uh, the reverse uh, procedure. The reverse the if the signal is not limited, you can do the same process, but you will not get back to the same signal. Okay? That's the condition, exactly the same as what we had in the Fourier domain. In the Fourier domain, we say just virtually that most of the signal, they are bounded in, in kind of, you know, bandwidths. But what happens if the signal is unlimited bandwidth? It means you're not able to get a good representation of that signal. Okay? The same way as here. Duality. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a nice step. We take the calculations of for example, the second period of the DFS or the third period of Doesn't matter. Just the one period. The values are the same. The values are the same. But the point is that this is just the amplitude values. You have also the phase. When you take the second period, the phases are shifted. So that's not the, the, the real phase. It's a shifted phase. So you have to take all of these values. These are the complex values. Don't forget about that. These are the complex values, and here I just show the magnitude of those EFT components. So there is a magnitude and the phase associated to this magnitude. If you take the, the, the other sample, the, the other period, for the case of the coefficients, the, the amplitude, the magnitude coefficients, that's the same. Doesn't matter. But what about the phase? It's a shifted phase. You have a jump in the phase. I hope just in a single slide, very simply to explain, to have explained this, the meaning of DFT. So DFT is very simple. That was the intuition behind the DFT. So it means that discrete Fourier series coefficient of the periodic form of the signal, using that n values, are the DFT coefficients of the original signal, the XFN. And that N is important, don't forget about the N. Always in MATLAB you say FFT, but you say N point FFT, and you have to, to pass the N parameter into the FFT. So you say FFT with N equal to 512, 1024, whatever. You have to pass the N. That N actually defines the, the FFT, the values of the FFT. Okay. In mathematical form, what I explained in the figure is mentioned here, just in a mathematical form. So you have the x of n, you make it periodic. But you take the first period, and that's the, that's the definition actually. You have the periodic form in the DFS domain, but you take only the period which is existent in, t in the limit of 0 to n minus 1, n as the param parameter of the DFT. That's for the signal domain. And that's for the DFT domain of frequency domain with these k values. So what is actually meaning is that instead of omega, which was continuous in frequency, you're actually using two pi over n, and that's the n value that you pass to the to the uh, function, two pi over n times the k, and changing the k, you're changing the frequencies. So you're actually taking the samples from the omega. You're taking the samples with the sample steps of 2 pi over n. The first one is, for example, 0. The second one is 1 times 2 pi over n. So that's the, that's the, uh, the basis, the most basic one. 2 pi over n is the step of how much you are you know, taking one sample to another. Then. So the k times 2 pi over n is the, the times of sampling or 
time is not a good idea. Step of the sampling over the frequency range of omega. Okay? So if n is large enough, 2 pi over n means very small steps. Small steps. And then you have k0, 1, up to n minus 1. And from k equal to 1 onward is actually repeating the same thing. So DF, DFT is also periodic, but you will just take one period from 0 to n minus 1. Okay? Clear? No question? If, we, if the higher the end would be, the finer our uh, handling. Uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, you, if you try to, you know, to, to actually uh, tend the end to the infinity, it means that the steps are exactly the same as the continuous omega. Okay. Like, like with frequency, we, we have here, we have such a thing that it would be uh, Twice, uh, the, the, the we, will, we will actually come back to the Nyquist frequency in just in a few okay. slides later. Okay. But uh, the idea is just, uh, as I explained, that's the step that you take. 2 pi over n and k times over 2 pi over n it means going through the different frequency uh, values with that resolution, which is 2 pi over n. The more n, the higher resolution. All of these things are also, uh, that's, you know, the brief of what I said. So it's DFT, when you say DFT, the analysis formulation for DFT would look like this. The synthesis form or the inverse DFT would look like this. And this capital W is nothing but as e to the power of j, 2 pi over n. So any basis function in the z domain, we use it as z. In the Fourier domain, we use it as e to the power of j something. In the DFT domain, we use it as W. That's a standard form of representation. And we know already that X of N is zero outside that range. And also, DFT values are considered to be zero outside that range. That N represents the time, but this one represents the frequency steps. K represents the frequency steps. And everything should be also Manage in the form of a matrix form. If you want to use MATLAB, for example, many commands in the MATLAB, they are formed by the matrix representations. That's just simply because you see that these are all series. Sigma. You have sigma. And you have sigma. And these are the vectors. So you can easily and simply take the matrix form for that. And any of the xk values, which are the DFT xk, k changing from 0 to n minus 1, can be easily represented as the series of these WN values times the signal version of that, time version of the signal. And the reverse process, just using the conjugate of these bases. We always have the conjugate form of the bases and the real form of the bases <coughs> to pass through the time domain and the frequency domain or um, the transform domain. So you see that these are just the conjugate. And because they are exponential form, the conjugate means putting a negative sign here. That's all. So these are the very similar matrices, and going from the time to the frequency, and reversely from frequency to the time. That was the end of story. So we talked about the continuous to discrete version of the signal and the quantization. We didn't talk about D2A, we just talked about the a to these, and we talked about the convolution sum, there's LSI systems, the TFTs that transform, briefly about DFS, but the DFT as a final transform, which is actually practically used in the DSP theory, and thank you for your attention. In the afternoon we'll go to the new story of uh, something that you'll see very soon.